It was way back in May 22nd when Femex Masix communicated to me this following problem along with a potential solution. And to put it simply, when I read Femex Masix solution, I was amazed because his solution was drenched with so many intuitive and elegant ideas and those ideas only required around two semesters of introductory calculus to understand which is a perfect fit when it comes to difficulty that I was thinking about when it comes to weekly math challenges. So I was excited, but there was one problem and the problem was there was one intuitive step in his solution that was not rigorously justified. So both Femex Masix and I tried to research, trying to come up with a way to ground his intuition in a rigorous fashion, but we were not able to. So I told Femex Masix, I am not comfortable using a problem that we do not know any rigorous solution to. So a week passed, then a month passed. Then I suddenly came upon this theorem as I was reading Serge Lang's undergraduate analysis, which seemed to be the key that we were looking for. And afterwards, with a gracious help from the Mass Stack Exchange community, this first lemma was verified that this sequence converges uniformly on this interval, which combined with this theorem allowed for a rigorous proof of the ideas that Femex Masix had in mind. Finally, this problem was posted as the 99th challenge, and I included these two facts in hopes that their inclusion may help some viewers craft a rigorous argument. Anyway, that's enough of a backstory I believe. Let's get to it. Let's actually try to solve this problem. For each positive integer n, let a sub n be the sum from k equals to 1 to n of nth root of k minus nth root of n. Okay, that's interesting. We wish to evaluate the limit as n goes to infinity of a sub n. First thing, we have a difference of the root, so you may consider trying to maybe rationalize this, but since we're taking nth root, it's not square root or cube root even, so doing so may seem to mess this up even more. This is a very neat little expression. We don't want to complicate it too much unless it's going to pave the way forward. Is there anything else we notice? Well, we know how to take the limit as n goes to infinity of nth root of n. In case you're not familiar with it, let me quickly go through it. So limit as n goes to infinity of nth root of n, I assert, is 1. There are many ways of proving it, but one of my favorite ways is to just take the natural log. When we take the natural log of this expression, we get natural log of n to the 1 over n power, because nth root is the same as 1 over n power, and that's 1 over n times the natural log of n, and when we take the limit as n goes to infinity of natural log of n over n, well, the linear function increases fundamentally faster than natural log function, which means that this thing is going to go to zero. The denominator increases much faster. And since the natural log of this limit is zero, the limit must be one because natural log and limit commute. But it's not as much as the presence of nth root of n, but more so what happens when we can take nth root of n outside the summation that we are interested in. Because when we take nth root of n outside, when we factor it outside, we get this expression. We have k equals 1 to n of nth root of n times nth root of k over n minus 1. Now, if you have studied calculus, if you have studied the limit definition of definite integral, realize we have a limit as n goes to infinity, we have a sum from k equals to 1 to n, and we have a k over n inside our expression, inside our sum end. What does that make you think of? Well, that may make you think of integral from 0 to 1 of some function. Why is that? Well, integral from 0 to 1 of f of x dx can be thought of as the area under the curve from 0 to 1. Then this in turn can be estimated by multiplying 1 over n by the sum from k equals to 1 to n of f of k over n. Because let's say we have n rectangles for the moment, then we're going to have a 1 over n. 2 over n for the width, 3 over n, all the way to n over n, and we're going to have the first rectangle having the height of f of 1 over n, that's f of 1 over n, then we're going to have second rectangle having height of f of 2 over n, if we look at the right end point, then f of 3 over n, all the way to f of n over n, or f of 1. So we are essentially multiplying the width by the height and the summing of the areas. So when we take the limit 
as we have infinitely many rectangles, limit as n goes to infinity, we are going to have the equality between these two expressions. And we have something very similar to that. We have limit as n goes to infinity, we have the summation, and we have some function of k over n inside. I think we are on to something, so let's continue this line of thought. So this is where we are at for our problem, and this is the definition of the integral from 0 to 1. Now, realize that n over n root of n, since that's independent of the index of summation, can be taken outside, and when we take the limit as n goes to infinity of n root of n, that's 1, so it goes away. So we essentially have limit as n goes to infinity of sum from k equals 1 to n of n root of k over n minus 1. We almost have the definite integral, except that we don't have this factor of 1 over n. We are so close. Wait, how, how about we just try to introduce a factor of 1 over n? So why don't we multiply this by n over n and try to use this 1 over n in some way? Well, then we gotta deal with this n in the numerator, and I'm not sure how we can work with that unless, unless, and this is the idea by Femus Mas 6 that took quite a while to resolve, we take the limit as n goes to infinity, but we, instead of writing n over n, we write x over n. We write x over n, and take limit as x goes to infinity as well. And let's say we multiply it by the summation from k equals 1 to n, of n root of k over n minus 1, but something more than that, we want this to be function of k over n, so we are okay with k over n, but we're not okay with n, we want to have k over n, so might as well replace the n in the radical to x as well. So let's change this to x and change this to x, and treat them separately. Certainly, that is a very intuitive and creative idea, but how do we, well, what's the rigorous foundation behind this? Because if you think about taking the limit, let's say n goes to infinity of n over n, that's obviously 1, but if we replace, if we replace 1n by x, so let's say we re replace the bottom one by x, then when we take the limit as x goes to infinity, so when x is going to infinity, we have a fixed n, so the inside is going to be 0. So we have limit as n goes to infinity of 0, which is going to turn out to be 0. So replacing just any n with x's and just adding another limit is not necessarily going to work. Because when we have two limits, we take the first one with x going to infinity but n fixed, while n stays the same. We take them one by one. So you may wonder, why does it work in this case? And that's when we return to these two assumptions that we may make. Looking at this theorem, we should realize that what we essentially want is right here. We have limit as n goes to infinity, then limit as x goes to infinity of some function of n and x, and in fact, we have the other way around as well. And we have what we originally had, limit as n goes to infinity of both of them being n. And what this theorem is telling you that all three of them are going to exist and be the same if the following hypothesis is satisfied. So what's our hypothesis? Well, this entire thing is f sub n of x, where x can be real number greater than zero and our n is a positive integer. So when we go back up, we want this f sub n of x as n goes to infinity to exist uniformly in this interval, but we have that. When we let f sub n of x be our function, we may assume that it converges uniformly on this, so we have the first hypothesis satisfied. We just gotta verify the second hypothesis, the limit as x goes to infinity of f sub n of x exists for any fixed n. So let's do so. Once we verify this, we can apply this theorem and go on. So we wish to show that limit as x goes to infinity of our function is going to exist for fixed n. So when we just take limit as x goes to infinity, n is fixed. Well, what is this going to be? We don't have a limit as n goes to infinity, so we cannot invoke the Riemann sum, invoke the definition of definite integral. So we gotta use some other way. And a clever way presented to me by Femus Mas 6 is the following. Instead of thinking about x going to infinity, let's think about x going to 0 from the right and replace all the x's with 1 over x. 
because this x going to infinity is going to happen if and only if dx in 1 over x is going to approach 0 from the right. So we're making the substitution from x to 1 over x. So we're going to have 1 over nx sum from k equals to 1 to n. And instead of having x root, we're going to have k over n to the x power because we have the exponent of 1 over x. So that's going to flip to exponent of x minus 1. And since our n is fixed, we have a finite summation. And the limit of a finite summation is going to be the finite summation of the limit. So we may safely put our limit inside along with this 1 over x, which can go inside the summation which is going to allow us to write this entire thing as 1 over n. Then we're going to have a sum from k equals to 1 to n. Then we have our limit of k over n to the x minus 1 or divided by x. Now this looks like the definition of a derivative. This becomes clear once we write this 1 as k over n to the 0. So we have our function, our function being k over over n to the x, it may be better to use f of t to distinguish between the x and the t. So if you think of our function as being k over n to the t power, we are evaluating it at some value close to zero. We're subtracting the value at zero. So we're taking the limit of this slope of a secant line from t equals to zero to t equals to x. And as x approaches zero, we're going to have the derivative of f of t at 0. And we see that f prime of t, since k over n is constant, is going to be natural log of k over n times k over n to the t. So f prime at 0, just this thing becomes 1, is going to be natural log of k over n, which means we have a 1 over n times the sum from k equals to 1 to n of natural log of k over n. So our limit exists. We have found a value for it. Now, all of the hypotheses, all of the constraints in this theorem are satisfied. So we can either take limit as n goes to infinity, limit as x goes to infinity, or the other way around. And I encourage you to try it the other way around if you're interested. You should get the same thing. But we are going to continue. Since we already took the limit as x goes to infinity, we just need to take the limit as n goes to infinity of this expression to finish it off. We are very close, but before we proceed and finish it, we should take this time to quickly recognize Ellen Lago, who was the very first person to correctly answer this problem. We also recognize Femath Mastix, who proposed this question. A huge shout out to both Ellen Lago and Femath Mastix. Returning our attention back to the problem, we see now we have a limit as n goes to infinity of 1 over n times the summation of a function of k over n. So we know this is a simply integral from 0 to 1 of a natural log of x dx. And when we integrate natural log of x, you should know that x times the natural log of x minus x. And we are going from 0 to 1. At 1, we have x times natural log of 1 minus 1. That's minus 1 because the natural log of 1 is 0. And now we're going to take away the value as we approach 0 from the right of x times the natural log of x minus x. Well, as x goes to 0, this x is going to disappear. But we got to still take a look at x times the natural log of x. One way to evaluate this is to use a relatively well-known limit as x goes to 0 from the right of x to the x, which is 1. This is essentially equivalent to the limit as x goes to infinity of x root of x being 1 that we proved earlier in the video. You can make the substitution from x to 1 over x. I'll leave that up to you. But we will take this for granted. We have limit as x goes to 0 from the right of natural log of x to the x power, putting this inside the natural log. And the natural log and limit can be switched because the natural log is a continuous function. And the limit as x goes to 0 from the right of x to the x is 1. So this part is going to become 0. Which means our answer is going to be, our final answer is going to be negative 1. Because we are taking away 0. So let's go all the way back up. This entire problem has boiled down to the answer negative 1.